Audiobook title, When the Sky Fell, Earthbound, a Gundam Fan Fiction, Chapter, 01-12, by Ren 3071, edited by Zephyr. Chapter 01, Falling Star, Alert. Structural integrity exceeds critical levels. All passengers are advised to evacuate to escape pods immediately. I repeat. The mechanical voice echoed urgently as we dashed toward the cargo bay my mother clutching my little sister tightly while we sprinted toward the escape capsule. Mommy. My sister's deer-streaked face held a mixture of fear and desperation as she clung to our mother while the cargo bay door swung open. Upon entering the cargo area, she squeezed my hand and guided me into the escape capsule alongside my sister. But the cramped capsule was already occupied leaving no room for us. My mother's expression turned grim as she faced this reality. She sealed the capsule's door, the hiss of pressurization filling the space. Mom, what are you doing? I shouted, pounding on the door. Trust me, my dear. There's another escape capsule over there. I'll join you soon, she reassured as she hurried to the control console amidst the tremors. Mom, Mom. My sister and I cried out, our pleas echoing in the confined space. My mother returned to the door her preparations seemingly complete as she smiled sadly at us. Not now, my loves. I understood the meaning behind that bittersweet smile. Zaft Fleet is stationed near southern Madagascar. We've sent a distress signal, they'll come for you, she explained before sealing the door, leaving us separated within the pressurized compartment. The escape capsule was pulled by gravity and the mechanical voice resumed its directives. Static followed by my mother's voice crackled through the radio. My darlings, live on. Her last words reached us before the transmission abruptly ended. I attempted to re-establish contact, but it was futile. Within the capsule, I witnessed our shuttle disintegrate in a barrage of energy beams as it blazed through the atmosphere, transforming into a cascade of falling stars. Amidst our cries and the pod's violent tremors, strangers clung to each other, united in terror. Children, women, men, fear painted every face. The cabin became a chaotic dance of stumbling bodies, screams and sobs mingling with the pod's vibrations, threatening its integrity. Finally, the capsule plunged into the ocean, jolting everyone before the chaos settled into a strained calm. Distress signal sent, encrypted message received. Search and rescue units inbound. ETA 870 minutes. Please remain seated and calm. The somber voice of the escape pod AI resonated as people gathered around windows, gazing out at the orange-hued horizon. Sis. My younger sibling's voice quivered as she held on to me, tear-filled eyes searching for reassurance. The strangers shared the same anxiety, their unfamiliar surroundings a stark contrast to the controlled environments of the plants where most coordinators lived. I smiled at my sister mustering strength as the older sibling. I hummed a lullaby her mother used to sing, soothing her fears. We'll be all right, I whispered. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting a golden glow on the boundless ocean. On the horizon, a slender gray line steadily drew closer, though the crew aboard the approaching vessel appeared unfazed. Engaged in their routine duties, sailors manned auto cannons and machine guns with calm efficiency. Missile tubes were primed and the vertical launch system brimmed with an array of missiles. Yet, tranquility pervaded the air, laughter and lapping waves created the ship's soundscape. This was another day aboard the guided missile frigate P'A.F.10.V. Durban, a routine patrol. The crew executed their tasks with professionalism, devoid of apprehension. Captain, a young man called, his voice hoarse from hours of pleading for aid. He saluted crisply conveying gratitude for his rescue. The captain regarded the pilot with concern. Any injuries? None, sir. Thank you for saving me, he replied with a smile. The captain smiled in return, intrigued by the young pilot's background. Are you a migrant? Yes, sir. Second generation. My grandparents migrated here from Eastern Europe in the 80s, he explained. The captain nodded thoughtfully. White migrants being a minority in the predominantly black and mixed race country. Conversations shifted to Chinese made equipment crashes in the sea, evoking shared laughter. Captain, still no word from home, the young pilot said, concern etching his voice. A broadcast extended their patrol mission by a week, conflicting with their return order. Nothing on civilian channels either. No signal, no radio, the pilot continued. Curiosity peaked. They puzzled over the inexplicable delay. Time marched on, 
and the sky unveiled a streak of light. Silence enveloped the Durban stack as crew members gazed upward, murmurs and whispers filling the air. What's that? A sailor questioned, eyes fixed on the luminous trail. Looks like a meteor, another remarked, fingers pointing skyward. Amidst the intrigue, the captain and pilot observed in awe, watching the celestial phenomenon unfold. The object traced across the sky leaving sailors fascinated. Conversations speculated its nature, yet no tension tinged the air. That was unexpected, the captain mused, a meteor during daylight defying convention. A meteorite this time? The pilot pondered. The Durban's journey carried on, radar operators vigilantly scanning for anomalies. A descending blip aroused their attention, a rapid descent from 100,000 feet. Captain, an anomaly on radar, an operator reported urgency in their tone. What kind? The captain inquired. Descending object at 100,000 feet, 10 kilometers east, the operator relayed. The captain and pilot rushed to the radar room, witnessing the object's trajectory and slowing speed. What if it's a missile? The pilot speculated. Destroy it before impact, the captain responded. Approaching the object's descent, it gradually slowed, Radar readings stabilizing. What's happening? The radar operator questioned. Send a helicopter for assessment, the captain ordered. The helicopter's departure and report puzzled the crew. It's cargo re-entry pod. Re-entry pod? Astronauts returning, the pilot confirmed. Tensions lingered as the helicopter's assessment concluded. A re-entry pod harboring survivors lay before them, rescued by the Durban's crew. As the Durban navigated the ocean's expanse, unbeknownst to them, Unadvanced fleet monitored their actions southeast of Madagascar. Unveiling a level of technology beyond comprehension, they bore an enigmatic purpose. A commanding figure aboard the fleet issued orders, capture the survivors, eradicate resistance. An eerie resolve marked their words. The unknown ship, towing the re-entry pod, remained oblivious to impending danger, an interstellar conflict of unforeseen magnitude. Chapter wrote 2, Hope. I gazed down at my little sister who lay asleep on my lap. Despite the rocking of the escape pod, she slept soundly. I envied her peace of mind, for my thoughts were a jumbled mess. We were in a dire situation, and the cramped space of the pod only added to the sense of dread that filled me. I had promised my sister that everything would be okay, but I wasn't sure I could keep that promise. The pod was so cramped that moving around was difficult. Outside, the sea crashed against the sides of the pod its salty water splashing against the window. I tried to find comfort in the rhythm of the waves and the salty air on my face, but the cramps in my legs made it hard to relax. Every few minutes, I shifted position in an attempt to alleviate the discomfort, but it was no use. The cramped space offered no respite. As I gazed out the window at the vast ocean, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at its immensity. It was a sight that I had never seen before. Having spent most of my life on a colony with no open bodies of water, the waves were rough, and the sea spray was salty against my face. As I looked around the cramped escape pod, I could see the other people who were with us, all sleeping or murmuring in their sleep. They were all members of our community, people who, like us, were discriminated against and oppressed by the world outside. My eyelids felt heavy, and I soon drifted off to sleep while sitting. However, I was suddenly jolted awake by the sound of chopping that could be heard, sending shivers down our spines. Other people also looked in the direction of the sound. Soon after, a light was pointed at us and circled around, revealing a helicopter. It was an uncommon sight on space colonies, and one thing was guaranteed, Zaft, my country's volunteer army, doesn't operate those in their submarines. Only a few Zaft bases exist here and the closest ones are in the Indian Ocean and Australia, thousands of kilometers away from Madagascar, making it unlikely for Zaft helicopter to be here in the remote region of southern Africa. Deploying surface combatants on Earth meant facing the numerical superiority of the vast armada of the Earth Alliance. Zaft could only resort to covert ops in unrestricted submarine warfare to cope with the numerical superiority of the enemy that they couldn't hope to match head-on. It is likely that the helicopter is not friendly and has discovered us. My sister, awakened by the panic of people, rubbed her eyes and looked confused. I hugged her and said, Nothing, Isla. Whatever happens, your older sister will protect you. I murmured, Sorry, Mom. I might come after you. Tears flowed down my cheeks, and Isla clutched onto my embrace. The helicopter announced, 
This is the Pan-African Federal Navy helicopter. Anyone with a radio, respond on our radio transmission. Rescue is on the way. If anyone is wounded, get out and wave a cloth or your hands. We will send in an immediate doctor and prioritize the medevac of that individual. Lastly, stay calm and collected. All of us were confused by the announcement. Is that the Navy of the African Union? Asked one of the people inside. No. They are not allowed to possess any armed service branch by the Brussels Treaty, and the Eurasian Federation won't allow any armaments or the creation of their own armed forces, clarified another. I wondered who and where this helicopter truly belonged to, and I looked at my sister's face and smiled to reassure her, and said internally, please don't be bad people, hoping that they wouldn't harm us, at least don't harm. I looked at my sister once more and patted her head. You really should be resting. Why are you here, Lieutenant? Commander? Asked the gunner, who was manning the 7.62mm minigun of the rubber bow dispatched towards the re-entry pod that Durbin had discovered, currently moving at almost 29 knots in the calm sea. The pilot smiled and replied, Lloyd Simrov. The gunner sighed and responded to his blunt manner, I'm Max Timbe. Where's your hometown? Lloyd? In Madagascar. And you? Asked Lloyd. Mozambique. He replied as a light splash of seawater washed over his clothes and vest. That's pretty far from here, isn't it? Remarked Lloyd. I got reassigned to Freetown, got no choice. You'll be randomly assigned to different parts of the country, said Max nonchalantly. Still, why did the captain let you come? I got excited when I heard it was a re-entry pod. It looked exciting. So I asked the captain to allow me to join your SAR operation. I was a medic practitioner before joining the military, so I had a good background to be recruited here. There might be a need for first aid, so I jumped in and volunteered to be part of the team, he explained, smiling wryly as he laughed about the reason why he was here. You son of a bitch, you're crazy. Max looked at him with disbelief. Thanks for the compliment, Lloyd chuckled as the helicopter approached. The silhouette of the re-entry pod came into view, and the Seahawk began giving orders over the radio. Seahawk to all units, approach the re-entry pod with caution. We can see civilians, including a child, in the door-like hatch, occasionally peeping. All rubber boats should proceed with caution. Over. Copy that, Seahawk. Approach with caution, responded one of the rubber boats. Roger, Seahawk. We will proceed with caution said another. As the rubber boats approached the re-entry pod, they could see the civilians inside more clearly. Max radioed back to Seahawk. Rubber boat 1 to Seahawk. We can confirm the presence of civilians, including a number of children. Requesting further instructions. Roger that, rubber boat 1. Maintain visual contact and tell for one last time about your approach. Over. Affirmative, Seahawk. Out. Max replied. That sounds cool when you're talking that way. Lloyd teased Max for his grumpy face before Max focused on the task at hand. Please set aside that idiotic side of yours, Lloyd, as he shrugged his words. Do you have your sidearm ready? Max continued. It's already loaded since earlier. Lloyd responded seriously but with a playful face. Max nodded and picked up the speaker. Attention. Attention. This is the rescue team. We are approaching your location and will soon be there to assist you. We will do everything we can to get you safely back to shore. Please remain calm and stay where you are. He put the speaker down and signaled the boat operator to increase speed, approaching the re-entry pod slowly. Lloyd had his sidearm at the ready, watching the hatch for any movement. After reaching the hatch area, Max immediately jumped onto the inflatable floating device of the re-entry pod cautiously covered by Lloyd and the boat operator. They kept their hands ready to bring out their sidearms in case of a violent escalation. I am Petty Officer 3rd Class Timbe. I'm here to rescue you. Please don't be alarmed. Is anyone wounded? We couldn't confirm because none of you replied to our transmission and instructions, he said while hanging onto the hatch, tense and ready to leap backwards towards the sea to evade being shot if someone fired a shot. As he scanned the interior of the re-entry pod, he noticed that the civilians were huddled together, some of them looking frightened and confused. He repeated his message, this time in a calm and reassuring tone, we are here to help. Please don't be afraid. Is anyone injured or in need of medical attention? One of the civilians, a middle-aged woman, stepped forward and said in broken English, my son, he is hurt. He needs help. Max instructed Lloyd via hand signals to stay outside and keep watch while he carefully climbed into the re-entry pod. 
his hand still on his sidearm but now pointed towards the ground. He approached the injured boy and began to assess his condition. Lloyd, bring out the first aid, Max seeing the injury, immediately gave out and ordered. Lloyd quickly entered the re-entry pot and was surprised to find that it was larger and more spacious than he had expected. It was even larger than their Dragon capsules which they had bought and licensed built from SpaceX subsidiaries Mars Heavy Industries and Prometheus Space Yard. Lloyd occasionally visited Freetown when the Pan-African Space Agency exhibits their indigenous satellite launch vehicles and other prototype rockets, including imports from other countries. As a result, he had a clear idea of how cramped the Dragon capsules were. They had been decommissioned by SpaceX in 2025 but were revived in 2029 after the Pan-African Federation acquired a license to produce them for their limited indigenous one-stage reusable rocket. This rocket was patterned after the Falcon 8, which was outdated by SpaceX standards but cutting edge for the Pan-African Federation. SpaceX did not mind granting a license since they received a penny for each Dragon capsule built for Pan-African use as it gave the Federation a certain degree of ability to reach low orbit for research and development of their space program. Not until they finally acquired several old SN-700 series SpaceX Starships, second-hand interplanetary capable ships that had only been used for a decade and had numerous upgrades that were far superior to what they had in hand, did they make the decision to schedule the Dragon capsule for final decommissioning next year. The SN-700 was the second type of starship used by Elon Musk to colonize Mars. 320 of these were built for the second wave of colonization efforts and brought almost 19,000 people and a large amount of supplies to Mars in a single trip. The SN-700 was gradually phased out by SpaceX, together with the older SN-60 series, in favor of the newer, larger, more powerful SN-1000, or so-called Millennium Series. The SN-1000 was almost twice as large as the original basic configuration used by SpaceX since 2015, with a total length of 97.5 meters, without the reusable boosters, which could account for a total length of 205 meters if combined. It was the largest spaceship so far, and no one had managed to surpass America in the race for colonization of solar system. That's why Lloyd is perplexed by the technology of this re-entry pod, which appears to be carrying at least 20 people, including children. Double time, says Max, finally snapping him out of reality. Then, Lloyd notices a wound on a child's leg, which appears to have been caused by shrapnel, and is messy and bound only by a white cloth. What happened to this child? He asks as it doesn't appear to be an accident. In. In the chaos, the mother appears scared to say a word, having a hard time responding. Seeing this, Lloyd realizes that something must have happened that has left the mother unable to speak. He sighed internally, and gave up asking, however, he'll pursue this later on. Max and Madam, properly hold the kid, he instructs. After following his instructions, Max and the mother put their hands on the clueless child. Without warning, Lloyd applies disinfectant. That hurts. It hurts. Mama. The child cries in tears. It's all right, baby. The pain will soon disappear, the mother reassures her child, whom struggling in agony. Disinfectant is good, but where are my bandages? Ah, here they are. Please stay still, he says as he begins to wrap the wounds of the struggling kid. That's good, but it's better to get on the ship to get better treatment. This is just first aid. Who's next? He asks. Noticing that no one else appears to be wounded or significantly injured. However, in his sight, a child about 10 years of age looked at his hand. His hand looked like a mess, as it had been bathed in salty water for the last 8 hours. Thus, the seawater had practically chipped parts of his hand. She was probably curious about it, as she looked at it intently. Does it hurt? She said in a worried voice. However, soon, a female who appeared to be her sister gagged her. They had the same feature of green hair, which was unnatural from the point of view of Max and Lloyd. When they saw them, they originally thought they were artificial. The older sister said, Sorry, my sister didn't mean anything. Please forgive us. Sounding defensive, Lloyd reacted with a bitter smile due to her rather overly reacting tone. Don't worry, you don't have to be hard on your sister, and for your question, Little kid, Lloyd looked at her. It's not hurting, thank you for worrying, he said. Then the child replied, Why do you have that hand? She asked in curiosity, 
and the sister appeared not to know why his hand was like that and did not stop her sister from questioning. Ha ha, long story short, he laughed bitterly and answered, I got my plane accidentally fall into the sea, and I was forced to stay for a few hours in the water before being rescued. So while I was out there, the seawater ate my hands, he said. Why did seawater eat your hand? She innocently asked. That's a bit complicated question to answer. Lloyd couldn't answer how the water turned his hand like this on this innocent kid's question. But they will heal later he said and grabbed a piece of chocolate bar from his pocket and handed it over to the kid. She looked at her sister as if asking for permission, which she reluctantly nodded. She received it and said, thank you. What's this? Chocolate, then followed suit to be patted by Lloyd. What's your name? Isla. Isla Reconquista. She is my sister, Evian Reconquista. She said happily while introducing them. The woman called Evian appeared to be embarrassed by her sister. I am Lloyd. Lloyd Simrov, and that guy is Uncle Max Timbe, he said, which made Max glare at him. We're from the Pan African Federal Navy, and you are in safe hands. Isla smiled and nodded, seeming to be comforted by Lloyd's words. Evian also looked relieved and grateful. Thank you so much for rescuing us, she said. We were on a shuttle with our parents when it suddenly exploded. Lloyd and Max exchanged a look of concern. Do you know what caused the explosion? Lloyd asked. Evian shook her head. We have no idea. It happened so suddenly. Our parents were. They didn't make it. Her voice choked on the last words, and Isla hugged her tightly. I'm so sorry for your loss, Lloyd said, his voice gentle. We'll make sure you're taken care of and get the help you need. We're going to bring you to our ship where our medical team can examine you and treat any injuries. Evian nodded, still holding her sister close. Thank you. She said quietly. Max stood up and gestured for them to follow. Come on, let's get you out of these sweaty clothes and into something dry. We have some spare uniforms that should fit you. Lloyd helped Eastland up, and the group made their way out of the pod. As they walked and board the rubber boats, Lloyd couldn't help but feel sorry for the two young girls who had lost their parents so suddenly. They left the re-entry pod and soon boarded Durban while their re-entry pod was towed. Chapter Row 3 Chapter 3 Veiled Alliances. As the tension in the ship reached a new high, Shambhala Devian and the others towards the bridge, weaving through narrow corridors and climbing multiple flights of stairs. The ship's alarms continued to blare, casting an eerie crimson hue along the passageways. Every footstep echoed the anticipation that hung heavily in the air. Upon entering the bridge, Shambo gestured for the coordinators to stand beside him at a console. The vast expanse of screens displayed the live feed of the surrounding space, with two unidentified craft clearly visible in the distance. The Earth Alliance insignia adorned their hulls, and they had positioned themselves in an ominous formation. Sun and Jerry exchanged uneasy glances as they took in the sight. Shambo's stern expression didn't waver as he addressed the coordinators. Sun, Jerry. I need you to provide as much information as you can about the Earth Alliance. We need to understand who we're dealing with. Siren cleared her throat, her voice slightly trembling. The Earth Alliance is a powerful political and military organization that controls a significant portion of Earth's population. They formed in response to tensions between naturals and coordinators during the cosmic era. Their aim was to secure Earth's resources and protect naturals from perceived coordinator threats. Jerry chimed in. His tone somber. During the early years of the Cosmic Era, the Earth Alliance developed advanced mobile suits and waged war against coordinators, who lived in space colonies known as plants. This conflict led to significant bloodshed and lasting animosity between the two groups. Shambo's gaze shifted between the screens and the coordinators. And the survivors we rescued. Their coordinators? Evian nodded. Yes. Captain. We're coordinators from the plant colonies. The Earth Alliance has long held a prejudice against us due to our genetic enhancements. Shambo's brows furrowed. Prejudice to the point of attacking unarmed civilians in a shuttle. Seems like an extreme response. Indeed, Siren replied, her voice laced with bitterness. The Earth Alliance perceives us as a threat, and they've taken drastic measures to eliminate what they consider to be an enemy. The attack on the shuttle was an act of terrorism. The Earth Alliance isn't monolithic, Jerry added. There are factions within it, some more extremist than others. It's likely that the attackers didn't represent the entire organization, but that doesn't make their actions any less dangerous. As the coordinators spoke, 
Shambo's expression grew darker. So, we're dealing with extremists within a powerful organization who are willing to shoot down the civilian shuttle to target coordinators. Exactly, Evian affirmed. And if they're here, it's because they want us back in their custody. They might be afraid of us sharing our experiences or revealing their actions to the wider world. Shambo's eyes flickered with determination. Well, I won't hand you over to them. Not without a fight. Sun and Jerry exchanged amazed glances. You're willing to defy the Earth Alliance? Sun asked, astonishment coloring her voice. Shambo leaned against the console, his expression resolute. I won't let them bully or threaten us. We stand for justice and protection. If they're going to throw their weight around, they'll find that we're not ones to be intimidated easily. A tense silence settled over the bridge as everyone absorbed Shambo's words. The two Earth Alliance ships continued their approach, their intentions shrouded in uncertainty. The fate of the survivors, the coordinators, and the crew of the Durban hung in the balance as the confrontation approached. As the tension mounted, the coordinators found themselves in the midst of a situation that was far removed from the familiar conflicts of the cosmic era. They had expected hostility, but Shambo's staunch support had caught them off guard. It was a stark reminder that humanity's response to the unknown could vary greatly, and alliances could form in the most unexpected places. The speakers crackled to life again, the voice of a crew member relaying critical information. Captain. The Earth Alliance ships are transmitting a message. Shambo straightened up and nodded to the crew member. Put it through. The bridge was filled with the voice of an Earth Alliance officer, its tone formal and unyielding. This is Commander Malcolm of the Earth Alliance. We demand the immediate surrender of the coordinator survivors on your ship. They are wanted for questioning regarding a security matter of utmost importance. Shambo exchanged a glance with Evian and the coordinators before responding. Commander Malcolm. I don't take kindly to threats or demands. We're a civilian vessel, and we won't be intimidated by military posturing. If you have concerns, we can discuss them diplomatically, but we won't hand over individuals without due process and assurance of their safety. There was a moment of silence before Commander Malcolm's voice came through again, this time with a hint of frustration. Captain, you are obstructing an Earth Alliance investigation. Failure to comply will be regarded as an act of hostility. Shambo's expression remained steadfast. Commander, we've already learned of the Earth Alliance's actions against the survivors of the shuttle. If you're looking for a fight, you'll find one. But I suggest we find a peaceful solution to this. The line went quiet, leaving the bridge in an anxious stillness. The Earth Alliance ships held their position their intent unclear. The Durban and its crew were poised for whatever might come next. Evian's heart pounded as she watched the tense standoff unfold. She couldn't believe that she, a coordinator from the plant colonies, was caught in the midst of a conflict far from the battles she was familiar with. Shambo's unwavering resolve had given her a glimmer of hope, a realization that not everyone in this unfamiliar era would view them with fear and hostility. As the seconds ticked by, the situation remained uncertain. The fate of the survivors, the coordinators, and the ship itself hung in the balance, waiting for the next move in this high-stakes confrontation. And as the tension mounted, alliances were formed, ideologies clashed, and a new chapter in history began to unfold. Chapter 04 continued. The ship's crew worked tirelessly to restore order and assess the damage caused by the attack. As the hours passed, the tension on the ship gradually eased. I found a quiet corner, still shaken by the recent events, and sat down with Lily in my arms, gently stroking her hair as she slept. I couldn't shake off the feeling of helplessness that had gripped me during the attack. We were so far from home, caught up in conflicts that were beyond our control. Jerry and Serene joined me in the corner, their expressions a mix of exhaustion and concern. Jerry sighed heavily and rubbed his temples. What a mess, he muttered. Clearly frustrated by the situation, Serene nodded in agreement. I didn't expect things to escalate this quickly. The Earth Alliance and Eurasian Federation are at odds, and we're stuck in the middle of it. I couldn't help but let out a bitter laugh. We thought we were leaving behind the war and conflict on the plants, but it seems like there's no escaping it. Jerry looked at me with a sympathetic smile. Sometimes, I think war is a part of human nature. No matter where you are, it's a sad reality. As we sat there, lost in our thoughts, Lloyd approached us with a more serious expression than usual. I just got an update from the crew, he said, 
his voice tinged with concern. The Earth Alliance and Eurasian Federation are still at there. They're regrouping and preparing for another attack. It's only a matter of time before they make their move. I felt a lump forming in my throat. What can we do? I asked, feeling the weight of our vulnerability. Lloyd clenched his fists. We need to be ready. The crew is doing everything they can to defend the ship. But we can't just sit back and do nothing. We need to be prepared to fight if it comes to that. Serene nodded in agreement. We might not be soldiers, but we can't just be passive. We have to protect ourselves and the people on the ship. Jerry looked determined. If it's a fight they want, then we'll give them one. We'll use every bit of knowledge and skill we have to help. Lloyd smiled his expression a mix of determination and pride. That's the spirit. Let's get through this together. And so, we spent the next few hours preparing ourselves. We found makeshift weapons and received basic training on how to defend ourselves. It was far from ideal, but it was the best we could do given the circumstances. As the sun began to rise, the tension on the ship reached its peak. Everyone was on high alert, watching the horizon for any signs of the approaching enemy. It was a strange feeling, knowing that our lives could be in the line at any moment. I held Lily close. Her small body a source of comfort amidst the uncertainty. Finally, the alarm sounded again. The crew members sprang into action, manning their stations with unwavering determination. The ship's systems hummed to life as we prepared for another battle. This time, the enemy forces came into view faster than we expected. Their aircraft filled the sky, their intent clear. The ship's cannons fired again and again, lighting up the pre-dawn darkness with fiery bursts of light. The battle was fierce. The sky filled with streaks of light and the deafening sound of explosions. In the midst of it all, I found myself on the deck, clutching a makeshift weapon in my hands. My heart pounded in my chest, and I exchanged glances with Serene and Jerry, who were also armed and ready. We didn't have the training or experience of soldiers, but we were determined to defend ourselves and those around us. Lloyd was at the forefront of the battle his skill and determination evident as he fought off enemy aircraft with a fierce resolve. I watched in awe as he maneuvered through the chaos, his actions purposeful and calculated. As the battle raged on, it became clear that our defenses were holding, but the enemy forces were relentless. Our ship's cannons continued to fire, but we were outnumbered. It was a battle of attrition, and our exhaustion was beginning to show. Just when it seemed like we were reaching our breaking point, a sudden burst of light illuminated the sky. The sound of engines roared overhead, drowning out the chaos of battle. I looked up and felt a surge of hope as a fleet of mobile suits descended from the sky, their white and blue frames a symbol of salvation. It's Zaft. Jerry shouted, his voice filled with relief. The Zaft mobile suits engaged the enemy forces with precision and power. Their presence turned the tide of battle and the enemy aircraft began to retreat. I watched in awe as the mobile suits fought with skill and determination, their movements a dance of destruction. Lloyd approached me, a triumphant grin on his face. Looks like our backup arrived just in time, he said, his voice lighthearted despite the chaos around us. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and gratitude. Thank you for everything, Lloyd. He shrugged his expression more serious now. We're all in this together. It's our duty to protect each other. As the enemy forces were driven back, the Saft mobile suits regrouped in the sky. The Earth Alliance and Eurasian Federation had been repelled, their threat momentarily neutralized. The ship's crew erupted in cheers and relieved laughter, the tension of the past hours giving way to a sense of victory. I looked around at the faces of the people who had fought alongside us, who had shown courage and resilience in the face of danger. Lloyd's voice broke through my thoughts. It's not over yet. The enemy won't give up so easily. We need to remain vigilant. He was right. The battle might have been won, but the war was far from over. As the day broke, painting the sky with shades of pink and gold, I held Lily close and looked out at the horizon. Our journey was far from what we had anticipated, filled with danger and uncertainty. But we were survivors and we were determined to overcome whatever challenges lay ahead. And so, we stood together on the deck of the ship, ready to face whatever came our way. The sun rose higher in the sky, casting its warm light upon us. With each passing moment, our resolve grew stronger, our spirits unwavering. As the new day began, I couldn't help but feel a sense of hope. We might be far from home, but we were not alone. We had each other, and together, 
we would navigate the uncharted waters of this new world. Chapter 05 Unrelenting Struggle The leader of the Eurasian Federation fleet's voice reverberated with authority, slicing through the tense atmosphere like a blade. What's the meaning of this? His demand cut through the air, echoing the confusion that gripped the fleet. The captain stood firm, his face etched with seriousness as he addressed the leader's concern. It appears to be a warship, possibly affiliated with Zaft or their sympathizers. He responded calmly, his words carrying the weight of analysis. However, capturing them without excessive force seems unlikely, he added, his eyes betraying his concern for the potential escalation. The leader's response was cold and unyielding. Then, sink them. If we cannot capture them, we will eliminate them, he declared, his voice devoid of emotion. The captain wasted no time his decisive order resonating through the ship. Engage full combat speed. Once we are within our effective anti-ship range, launch our attacks. His words were a rallying cry, driving the crew to action. The ship surged forward with a raw power that resonated through every part of its being. The rush of water, the howl of the wind, and the vibrations of the engines blended into a symphony of anticipation. Every crew member was on edge, ready for the impending clash. Amidst the intensity, the ship's weapon systems were primed for combat, heavy artillery humming with potential destruction. Crew members manned their stations with a steely resolve, their fingers poised to unleash chaos upon command. As the distance between the fleets closed, the radar revealed the enemy vessel's presence. The tension reached its zenith as the captain's calm but authoritative voice echoed, prepare for engagement. The crew held their breath. Adrenaline coursing through their veins. Fire. Missiles erupted from their launch systems, streaking towards their target with unwavering determination. The sky illuminated briefly, a calculated display of force and precision. The crew watched with intent, their silent unity a stark contrast to the chaos outside. As the anti ship missiles soared, a tense struggle unfolded on the Durban's bridge. Captain Shambo's urgency was palpable as they attempted to counter the incoming threat. Alarms blared and the ship's movements were orchestrated with desperate precision. The explosion was a harsh reminder of the stakes involved. Yet, the crew's response was unwavering. The bridge transformed into a hub of coordinated action, a symphony of expertise and teamwork. Defenses sprang to life, countermeasures deployed against the merciless barrage. The ship maneuvered deftly, evading missiles with calculated grace. The crew's focus was palpable every movement a testament to their training and resolve. The seals unleashed its fury, a dazzling display of firepower against the night sky. But amid the storm, one missile persisted. It found its mark, and the ship quaked under the impact. Chaos reigned in the aftermath, but the crew's determination held strong. Together, amidst the wreckage and rising waters, they fought to save their ship and retaliate against their assailants. As the Durban faced its dire circumstances, the Eurasian fleet also found itself in peril. Hidden threats emerged, revealing the vulnerabilities of their position. The once formidable force crumbled under unseen attacks, leaving confusion and desperation in its wake. In the midst of this chaos, Captain Errol of the Zaft submarine Chenil faced a new mission. The urgency of locating their fellow coordinators gripped them, their determination unwavering despite the odds. With Din and Guru units deployed, their coordinated efforts surged forth a symphony of resolve and skill. As the ships converged, the clash between forces became inevitable. In this chapter of unrelenting struggle, destinies collided, and the resolve of every individual involved was tested to its limits. The uncertainty of the outcome hung heavy, a reminder of the unpredictable nature of war and the unyielding spirit of those who fight for their beliefs. Chapter Row 6 Fractured loyalties. The aftermath of the clash left a haunting silence in its wake. The Durban, wounded and battered, stood as a testament to the ferocity of battle. On board, the crew worked tirelessly to contain the damage and tend to the wounded. Captain Shambo's stern gaze surveyed the scene, his heart heavy with the weight of responsibility. He knew that every decision made in the coming moments would shape the fate of their ship and its crew. Status report, Captain Shambo demanded his voice firm despite the fatigue that clung to his words. A crew member, their uniform stained with blood and dirt, stepped forward. Structural integrity is severely compromised, Captain. The hull breaches have been contained, but we're dead in the water. Our propulsion and power systems are heavily damaged. Captain Shambo's jaw tightened, his mind racing as he considered their options. Can we launch the anti-ship missiles? He inquired, 
hope glimmering in his eyes. The crew member hesitated, their expression conflicted. The launchers are severely damaged, Captain. We're unable to confirm if they're operational. A heavy sigh escaped Captain Shambo's lips. The prospect of retaliation was slipping through their fingers and desperation crept into his thoughts. Stabilize the ship first. We can't afford to sink here, he commanded, his voice a mixture of determination and frustration. Amidst the turmoil, the crew rallied. They worked tirelessly to repair what they could, their unity unwavering in the face of adversity. As they toiled against time, their efforts breathed life back into the stricken ship. Hours stretched into an eternity as their determination pushed the Durban back from the precipice. Finally, a glimmer of hope emerged. Captain, the missile launchers are operational. A crew member reported, a spark of triumph in their eyes. Captain Shambo's resolve intensified. Prepare to launch the remaining anti-ship missiles, he ordered, his voice resonating with determination. We won't go down without a fight. The crew moved with urgency, their actions synchronized and focused. The missile launchers roared to life, their deadly payload ready to be unleashed. The atmosphere was charged with tension a reflection of the crew's unyielding spirit. As the missiles streaked into the night sky, the remnants of the Eurasian fleet lay in disarray. A sense of desperation had taken hold, their leaders once unshakable authority fractured by the chaos that surrounded them. Amid the confusion, questions arose, sowing the seeds of doubt. One of the fleet's high-ranking officers stepped forward, their expression a mix of concern and frustration. What is our status? They demanded their voice tinged with urgency. A subordinate rushed to deliver the grim report. Our propulsion systems have been severely damaged, and several key areas of the ship are inoperable. We are vulnerable to further attacks. The high-ranking officer clenched their fists, their loyalty to the fleet warring with the realities of their predicament. We must regain control. Alert all remaining vessels to converge and defend, they ordered, their voice resolute. As the order was relayed. The remaining fleet members scrambled to re-establish formation, seeking refuge in their collective strength. The chaos had revealed fractures within their unity, but the threat that loomed ahead forced them to rally once more. Amidst the turmoil, the crew of the Zaft submarine Chenille continued their search. Captain Errol's gaze remained fixed on the horizon, his thoughts consumed by the safety of their fellow coordinators. The Din and Guru units scoured the area. Their sensors calibrated to detect any trace of the escape capsule. Suddenly, a blip on the radar caught their attention. Captain, we've detected an object matching the escape capsule's signature. A crew member reported, their voice tinged with anticipation. Captain Errol's heart skipped a beat, hope surging within him. Bring us closer, he ordered, his voice a mixture of caution and excitement. The chenille maneuvered with precision, drawing closer to the signal's origin. As they approached, their screens displayed an image that sent shock waves through the crew. The escape capsule lay adrift, damaged and battered, but still intact. We've located the escape capsule, Captain Errol exclaimed, his voice laced with relief. Efforts were immediately redirected towards the rescue mission. The Guru units extended their mechanical arms, delicately securing the capsule to ensure its safe retrieval. As the capsule was brought aboard, Captain Errol's heart swelled with a mixture of triumph and concern for those within. Inside the capsule, Serene and her fellow coordinators stirred from their forced slumber. Disorientation gave way to realization as the capsule's interior lights flickered to life. Their eyes met, a mix of relief and exhaustion mirrored in their expressions. We're safe, Serene whispered, her voice barely audible over the hum of the capsule's systems. The others nodded in agreement their bonds forged through shared struggle. As the capsule was lowered onto the chenille's deck, the sense of unity among the coordinators grew stronger. They had survived the storm, and their journey was far from over. Back on the Durban, Captain Shambo watched as the last of their anti-ship missiles streaked towards their target, a testament to their unyielding spirit. The impact was a blaze of light, an assertion of defiance against the odds. The battle was far from won, but the crew's resolve burned brighter than ever. As the echoes of the clash subsided and the ships maneuvered in response, the next chapter of their intertwined destinies took shape. Fractured loyalties, hidden motivations, and unyielding determination converged in a struggle that would test the limits of their abilities and reshape the course of history. Chapter Row 7 Convergence of Fates The restless sea carried with it an air of uncertainty as the damaged Durban navigated the waters, its crew resolute in their pursuit of survival. On board, Captain Shambo stood at the helm, 
his gaze fixed on the horizon. His thoughts were a tempest of contemplation as he considered the recent events that had thrust his ship into this tumultuous journey. As the Durban continued its course, a new blip appeared on the ship's radar, a presence that wasn't recognized. The crew's tension heightened, their focus shifting to the unfolding situation. The Zaft submarine Chenille emerged from the depths, its sleek hull cutting through the water with an air of purpose. On the bridge of the Durban, alarms blared and crew members exchanged bewildered glances as the unfamiliar submarine neared. Captain Shambo's stern expression betrayed his concern his hand gripping the railing as the chenille came into view. A voice crackled over the communication system, breaking the tense silence. This is Captain Errol of the Zaft submarine chenille. Stand down your weapons and prepare to be boarded for inspection. Captain Shambo exchanged a glance with his crew, his thoughts racing as he considered the implications of the encounter. He raised his hand to acknowledge the message, his voice steady as he responded. This is Captain Shambo of the Pan-African Federal Navy Frigate P-F.V.N. Durban. We pose no threat and are open to communication. The tension hung heavy in the air as the two vessels approached each other cautiously. Crew members aboard the Durban prepared for potential confrontation, while those on the Chenille stood ready to respond to any aggression. As the Chenille's hatch opened, a contingent of Zaft personnel emerged their weapons at the ready. Captain Errol led the way, his expression a mix of caution and curiosity. He stepped onto the Durban's deck, his eyes locking onto Captain Shambo. Captain Shambo held himself with a mixture of authority and respect, his hand outstretched in a gesture of greeting. Welcome aboard the Durban, Captain Errol, he said, his voice measured. Captain Errol regarded Captain Shambo with a nod, his expression wary yet open. Captain Shambo, he acknowledged. His tone neutral. I hope you can understand our caution in these uncertain times. Captain Shambo nodded in agreement. Indeed, caution is wise. We find ourselves in a situation none of us could have predicted. The two captains stood in a tense silence, their eyes locked in a silent exchange of understanding. The crews of both vessels watched with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, awaiting the outcome of this unexpected encounter. Breaking the silence. Captain Errol spoke. We were tracking an escape capsule, which we believed to be carrying fellow coordinators. To our surprise, we found it in the vicinity of your vessel. Captain Shambo's brow furrowed in realization. The escape capsule, he mused, his thoughts racing to the moment they had launched their anti-ship missiles. I regret to inform you that we engaged the capsule in self-defense believing it to be a threat. We were unaware of its true nature. Captain Errol's expression remained unreadable as he absorbed the information. I see, he responded, his voice a mix of understanding and disappointment. Fortunately, we managed to retrieve the capsule and its occupants before any harm could be done. The weight of the situation settled over the captains, a reminder of the complexities of their predicament. As they navigated the uncharted waters of their meeting, the crews of both vessels watched their loyalties tested by the new alliances forming before their eyes. Amidst the exchange, Serene and her fellow coordinators emerged from the chenille, their expressions a mix of curiosity and weariness. Their eyes widened as they took in the sight of the Durban and its crew, a reminder that they were no longer alone in this unfamiliar world. Captain Shambo's attention shifted as he noticed the newcomers, his gaze softening as he regarded them. I assume these are the occupants of the escape capsule, he inquired. Captain Errol nodded, his gaze flickering to Serene and her companions. Indeed, these are our fellow coordinators. Our mission was to rescue them. Serene stepped forward, her expression a mix of gratitude and curiosity. Thank you for your assistance, she said. Her voice tinged with exhaustion. We've been through quite an ordeal. Captain Shambo regarded Serene with a nod of understanding. You're safe now. We may be strangers in this world, but we are united by our shared circumstances. As the captains and their crews exchanged wary glances, the realization of their shared struggle began to bridge the gap between them. The encounter marked a turning point in their respective journeys, a convergence of fates that would shape their destinies in ways they could never have imagined. Unbeknownst to both crews, a sense of urgency lingered beneath the surface. The encounter between the Pan-African Federal Navy and Zaft marked the beginning of a new chapter in their shared saga. As they navigated the challenges of their unfamiliar surroundings, they would uncover truths that defied comprehension and confront a reality that shattered the boundaries of their known world. Chapter 08 
Threads of Fate High above the turbulent waters of the New World, the orbital station Requiem orbited silently. Within its expansive halls, the enigmatic scientist Lloyd Asplund moved with purpose, his thoughts consumed by the mysteries that surrounded him. A holographic screen displayed complex equations and simulations a testament to his ceaseless pursuit of knowledge and power. As Lloyd delved into his research, a pair of figures approached him. Isla Reykwankista and Evian Reykwankista, the identical twin sisters and skilled pilots, walked gracefully in their distinctive uniforms. Their presence was an embodiment of precision and unity, reflecting the careful discipline they had honed through years of training. Dr. Asplund, Isla began, her voice respectful yet tinged with curiosity. We've reviewed the data from the recent encounter between the Pan-African Federal Navy and the Zaft submarine. It appears that we've entered an entirely different Earth. Lloyd's gaze remained fixed on the holographic projections, his mind processing the information as he spoke. Indeed, the phenomena that brought us here defies conventional understanding. Our world's boundaries have expanded beyond what we thought possible. Evian interjected, her tone thoughtful. The Durban and the Chenille's presence suggests that we're not the only ones affected by this shift. Other forces are at play. Lloyd turned his attention to the twins, a knowing smile gracing his lips. The tides of fate are complex, my dear sisters. As the world reshapes itself, new alliances will form and the threads of destiny will intertwine. Isla's brow furrowed in contemplation. What do you foresee, Doctor? How will these alliances influence the course of events? Lloyd's eyes gleamed with a mix of excitement and ambition. As the Durban and the Chenille converge, the seeds of cooperation and conflict are sown. Our own ambitions align with the chaos that unfolds, and we shall seize this opportunity to further our cause. Evian's gaze sharpened her resolve unwavering. To unlock the full potential of our coordinator abilities, even in this unfamiliar world, Lloyd nodded in agreement. Precisely. The world's transformation has granted us a unique advantage. We possess knowledge and capabilities beyond their comprehension, and we shall use these to shape events to our advantage. As Lloyd spoke, his holographic projections displayed intricate designs of mobile suits and advanced technologies. Isla's gaze lingered on the schematics, her mind racing with the possibilities they represented. Our research into mobile suit development will undoubtedly prove invaluable, Lloyd continued. And our coordination with our allies, the Pan-African Federal Navy and the Zaft forces, will provide us the means to achieve our goals. Evian's eyes narrowed slightly. But alliances can be precarious. How can we ensure our interests are prioritized? Lloyd's smile widened, a hint of mischief in his expression. That, my dear sisters is where our skills in manipulation and strategy come into play. We shall become the puppeteers, guiding events towards outcomes that serve our purpose. Isla's voice was laced with determination. And the Durban and the Chenille crews? How will they fit into this grand design? Lloyd's gaze turned distant, as if seeing beyond the present moment. They are pawns in a greater game, unknowingly drawn into the symphony of fate. Their actions will shape the future and we shall be the composers of their destinies. As Lloyd's words resonated through the chamber, the twins exchanged a glance, their commitment unwavering. The scientists' vision had ignited a fire within them, a determination to navigate the intricate web of alliances and conflicts that awaited them. As the orbital station Requiem continued its silent orbit above the newly transformed Earth, Lloyd Asplund's ambitions burned bright, entwining with the threads of destiny that connected them all. The stage was set and the players had taken their positions, ready to dance to the tune of fate. Chapter 09, Convergence of Leaders In the heart of the Pan-African Federation's naval base, a secure conference room hummed with activity. Admiral Sara Kasser, the seasoned leader of the Pan-African Federal Navy, sat at the head of the table, her gaze focused and resolute. The events of recent days had thrust her into a world of uncertainty and unexpected alliances. Across from her, Captain Shambo of the beleaguered P'F.V.N. Durbin took a seat, his expression a mixture of determination and weariness. His crew had weathered trials that had brought them face to face with new enemies and unimaginable challenges. Admiral Kasser broke the silence, her voice carrying a weight of authority. Captain Shambo, the events surrounding the appearance of the Eurasian Federation fleet and the encounter with the Zaft submarine have revealed that we are not alone in this new world. Shambo nodded, his gaze unwavering. Indeed, 
Admiral, the emergence of these forces suggests that we are navigating uncharted waters, both literally and metaphorically. Zara's gaze softened as she regarded the captain before her. Your actions in defending the Durban were commendable, Captain. The lives of your crew and the safety of our nation are of paramount importance. Shambo inclined his head in gratitude. We may have suffered losses, but our determination remains unshaken. Our resolve to protect our people and uphold the principles of the Pan-African Federation remains steadfast. Zara's lips curved into a faint smile. Your spirit mirrors that of our people, Captain. And it is with that spirit that we face this new world. Their conversation was interrupted by the entrance of two figures. Lloyd Aspland, the enigmatic scientist with his own ambitions, entered alongside Isla Reconquista and Evian Reconquista the twin pilots whose capabilities were unmatched. Admiral Kasser's gaze narrowed slightly, her curiosity peaked. Dr. Aspland, your presence here is unexpected. Lloyd's smile held a touch of charm and intrigue. Admiral Kasser, I believe it is in the best interest of all parties involved that we engage in open dialogue. Our current situation requires unprecedented cooperation. Captain Shambo's gaze sharpened as he regarded the newcomers. And how do we know that your intentions align with ours, Doctor? Isla's voice was measured and calm. Our objectives are clear, Captain. We seek to harness our unique abilities to ensure the safety and advancement of our fellow coordinators. Evian's gaze held a determination that matched her sister's. Our capabilities are not to be taken lightly. They can be a force for both protection and destruction. Lloyd interjected his tone confident. Captain Shambo, Admiral Kasser, the emergence of new threats and powers demands that we set aside differences and forge an alliance that transcends conventional boundaries. Admiral Kasser's gaze moved from Lloyd to the twin pilots and finally to Captain Shambo. Our situation is dire, but our shared goals may serve as a foundation for unity. The Pan-African Federation Navy, the Durban's crew, Zaft forces, and Dr. Asplund's expertise, this collaboration may be our best chance. Shambo's expression was one of contemplation. Alliances formed under such circumstances are delicate. Trust must be earned. Lloyd's smile was both enigmatic and sincere. Trust, Captain, is a valuable currency. Our actions will determine whether we earn it or not. Amidst the uncertainty and tension, a seed of cooperation had been planted. The leaders of different worlds and factions sat across from each other brought together by the convergence of fate. In their hands rested the power to shape their destinies and navigate a world transformed. As the discussion continued, voices intermingled, and the contours of an alliance began to take shape. The room, once filled with a weight of uncertainty, gradually transformed into a crucible of shared purpose. In this moment, the destinies of the Pan-African Federal Navy, Zaft, and Lloyd Asplund's ambitions were entwined setting the stage for a partnership that could tip the balance of power in this new world. Outside the conference room, the sun cast its warm glow over the naval base, a reminder of the world beyond the confines of strategy and negotiation. And as leaders forged connections within, the sun's light symbolized the glimmer of hope that their actions could bring to a world in flux. Chapter 10, Confronting Shadows The Looming Threat of Blue Cosmos an organization driven by hatred for genetically modified coordinators, sent shockwaves through the alliance formed by the Pan-African Federal Navy and Zaft. As tensions escalated, the two forces realized that unity was not just a strategy, it was an imperative. Reports poured in from across the globe, detailing blue cosmos acts of terror and chaos. The extremist group targeted coordinators and sympathizers, aiming to incite fear and discord. Innocent lives were caught in the crossfire and the world watched with trepidation as history seemed to repeat itself. In a high-level joint meeting aboard a specially equipped Zaft vessel, Admiral Sara Kasser, Captain Shambo, Isla Reconquista, and Evian Reconquista shared intelligence and strategies. Lloyd Aspland, the enigmatic scientist, provided technological insights that could aid their efforts. Admiral Kasser's voice echoed with determination. Blue Cosmos is trying to divide us and exploit our differences. We must stand united against their hateful agenda. Captain Shambo nodded, his resolve unwavering. Our ships and personnel will work together to thwart their plans and protect the innocent. Lloyd's fingers danced across a holographic interface. I've devised an algorithm that can predict potential targets. It's not foolproof 
but it could give us an edge. Isla's expression was steely. We need to expose their operations to the world, strip them of anonymity. Evian's eyes burned with intensity. And we must reach out to potential sympathizers, show them the truth behind Blue Cosmos lies. The room brimmed with collective purpose, a shared resolve to overcome a common enemy. Their integrated efforts included joint operations, intelligence sharing, and even cultural exchanges to foster understanding between the factions. In a tense showdown off the coast of a major city, the Alliance intercepted a blue cosmos cell attempting to unleash chaos. The coordinated response was swift and decisive, employing advanced weaponry and tactics. The battle was fierce, but the unity forged between the Pan-African Navy and Zaft proved formidable. Together, they thwarted the attack, ensuring that panic was replaced with resilience. As news of their victory spread, people around the world began to rally against Blue Cosmos. Protests and campaigns emerged, condemning the extremist group's actions and beliefs. The tide of public opinion began to turn, revealing the strength in unity and shared values. Through relentless efforts, the Alliance exposed the leaders behind Blue Cosmos, revealing their dark history and motives. The world recoiled in horror at the revelations, shattering any support the organization had garnered. In a final, coordinated assault, the Alliance stormed a hidden Blue Cosmos stronghold. The clash was fierce, but the enemy was overwhelmed by the combined might of the Pan-African Navy and SAFT forces. As the smoke cleared, the leaders of Blue Cosmos were captured, their reign of terror definitively ended. With the threat neutralized, a sense of triumph and relief settled over the Alliance. However, the scars left by Blue Cosmos actions would not fade easily. The world had witnessed the power of unity and cooperation as well as the destructive force of hatred. Admiral Kasser stood on the deck of her flagship, gazing out at the horizon. We've shown that even the darkest ideologies can be overcome when we stand together. Captain Shambo joined her, a faint smile on his lips. Our differences make us stronger. It's a lesson we won't forget. As the Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces looked to the future, their alliance remained a symbol of hope, a beacon that proved the possibility of overcoming hatred even across different timelines. Chapter 11, Clash of Resolve The sun hung low in the sky, casting long shadows over the azure waters as the Pan-African Navy and Zaft Mobile Suit Force prepared to engage the Blue Cosmos terrorists in a decisive battle. The seas were turbulent, mirroring the intensity of the impending confrontation. Admiral Zara Kasser stood on the bridge of her flagship, her gaze unwavering as she observed the enemy's fleet on the horizon. Beside her, Captain Shambo manned the communications station, ready to relay orders to their fleet and the Zaft mobile suit force. We've got visual on the enemy fleet, reported Captain Shambo, his voice steady despite the tension in the air. Admiral Kasser nodded. Prepare all units for battle. We can't allow Blue Cosmos to continue their reign of terror. Across the waters, the Blue Cosmos fleet, comprised of stolen and modified warships, bristled with weaponry. But the Pan-African Navy and Zaft were not to be underestimated. Their forces had been training and strategizing together for weeks, honing their coordination and fine-tuning their battle plans. On board the lead Zaft vessel, Isla Reconquista and Evian Reconquista prepared to launch in their mobile suits. They shared a determined glance, their synchronicity a testament to their close bond as siblings and fighters. Their mobile suits, equipped with advanced weaponry and shields, were in force to be reckoned fault with. Stay close, Isla, Evian said over the communication link, his voice firm. I will, Evian, Isla replied. Let's end this. As the Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces closed in on the Blue Cosmos fleet, chaos erupted. Missiles streaked across the sky, accompanied by the blinding bursts of energy weapons. The battle had begun. Mobile suits from both factions surged forward, their movements fluid and precise. Isla and Evian led the charge, their mobile suits weaving through the chaos with calculated grace. Evian's GNW003 Gundam thrown dry unleashed a barrage of beam shots, decimating enemy targets. Isla's GNW001 Gundam thrown nines moved with unparalleled agility, deflecting enemy fire with her beam shield and retaliating with precision shots. The Pan African Navy's ships unleashed a torrent of firepower their cannons and missiles pounding the enemy fleet. Zaft mobile suits engaged in close quarters combat, their swords and beam sabers clashing against enemy units. The clash of metal and the glow of energy lit up the battlefield. Admiral Kasser's flagship, the mighty Paphn Skybori, 
positioned itself strategically, coordinating the efforts of the fleet. The ship's sea systems were in constant motion, intercepting incoming missiles with rapid fire precision. On board the Chenille, Lloyd Asplund analyzed the battle data, providing real time insights to the mobile suit pilots. Pan African Navy, keep the pressure on the enemy's left flank. Zaft, focus on neutralizing their long range support. The pilots responded with swift obedience. Adjusting their strategies based on Lloyd's guidance, the battlefield was a symphony of chaos and coordination, a dance of warships and mobile suits that painted the sea with destruction. Evian's Gundam throne dry clashed with a blue Cosmos mobile suit, its armor shattering under the force of his attacks. Isla's Gundam throne nines deftly evaded enemy fire, retaliating with her own barrage of energy shots. The siblings' synergy was unparalleled. Their movements a seamless blend of offense and defense. Amidst the turmoil, Blue Cosmos flagship emerged from the chaos, its massive cannons charging for a devastating shot. Isla's Gundam throw nines intercepted the shot with her shield, the impact reverberating through the mobile suit. Evian swiftly moved into position, his Gundam thrown dry launching a barrage of missiles that crippled the flagship's cannons. As the battle raged on, the tide began to turn. The Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces fought with unyielding resolve, their unity and determination pushing them forward. Blue Cosmos fleet began to falter, their formations breaking under the combined onslaught. Admiral Kasser's voice echoed through the communication channels. Target the enemy's command ship. We must cripple their leadership. The Pafn Skyberry unleashed a barrage of missiles that struck the enemy command ship cribbling its systems. Zaft's mobile suits converged on the flagship, their coordinated attacks rendering it defenseless. With their command ship disabled, the Blue Cosmos fleet was in disarray. Mobile suits and warships alike fell to the combined might of the Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces. The battle reached its climax as the remaining enemy forces attempted a desperate retreat. Admiral Kasser watched as the last traces of resistance were quelled. She sighed, relief washing over her. It's over. Captain Shambo nodded, his exhaustion masked by satisfaction. We did it. As the smoke cleared and the waters grew calm, the Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces regrouped. The Alliance had prevailed, and the threat of Blue Cosmos had been extinguished. Isla and Evian Reconquista's mobile suits hovered above the waters, their silhouettes illuminated by the setting sun. They shared a triumphant glance their journey through battles and adversity culminating in this moment of victory. In the aftermath of the battle, the Alliance continued to strengthen their bonds. The collaboration between the Pan-African Navy and Zaft had proven its effectiveness, and the world took note. The legacy of their unity would resonate far beyond this battle, a testament to the power of working together to overcome even the darkest of threats. Chapter 12 Return to Worlds. The aftermath of the intense battle against the Blue Cosmos terrorists left the sea scattered with debris, a solemn reminder of the conflict that had unfolded. The Pan African Navy and Zaft forces regrouped, taking stock of their losses and assessing the damages sustained during the confrontation. The alliance that had formed in the face of adversity now stood united in victory, though the scars of battle ran deep. On board the Path and Skybori, Admiral Sara Kasser stood on the bridge her gaze fixed on the sea. The weight of command and the toll of battle were etched into her features. Beside her, Captain Shambo coordinated with crew members, ensuring that damage control efforts were underway and that all personnel were accounted for. Admiral, Captain Shambo's voice broke the silence. Initial reports indicate that our losses are significant, but we managed to repel the enemy. Admiral Kasser nodded. We couldn't have done it without the support of our Zaft allies. This victory belongs to all of us. In a neighboring control room, Lloyd Asplund monitored the data streams, analyzing the battle's outcome. The genius scientist wore a rare expression of contentment, a testament to the success of the joint operation. Excellent work, everyone, Lloyd said, his voice tinged with satisfaction. Our coordination was the key to overcoming the Blue Cosmos threat. Elsewhere, Isla Reconquista and Evian Reconquista stood on the deck of their respective mobile suits, surveying the aftermath of the battle. The sea breeze ruffled their hair, and the setting sun cast a warm glow over the horizon. We did it, Isla, Evian said, his tone a mixture of relief and exhaustion. Isla nodded, a sense of accomplishment filling her. Yes, we did. The sacrifices were worth it. Their sibling bond had been tested and strengthened throughout the battles they had faced. As they looked out at the peaceful sea, they knew that their contributions, 
alongside those of their fellow fighters, had ensured a better future. In the days that followed, recovery efforts were swift. The Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces worked together to repair damaged ships and mobile suits. The alliance that had formed on the battlefield had solidified into a partnership, one that extended beyond the immediate crisis. On board the Chenille, Lloyd Asplund facilitated discussions between the Pan-African Navy and Zaft representatives. Plans were made to continue joint operations sharing intelligence and resources to ensure stability in the face of future threats. The battle against Blue Cosmos showed us the importance of unity, Admiral Kasser stated during one of the meetings. Our worlds may be different, but our goals are aligned, peace and security. Zaft's commander Altau echoed her sentiment. The fight against hatred and extremism requires constant vigilance. By standing together, we send a powerful message. As the days turned into weeks. The Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces began to wrap up their operations in this parallel Earth. The reconnaissance missions revealed that the worlds they had stumbled upon were vastly different from their own. Yet, despite the differences, there were also similarities. People striving for a better life, societies grappling with complex issues, and a shared aspiration for peace. Admiral Kasser and Captain Shambo stood on the shore gazing out at the sea. The sky above was painted in hues of orange and pink, a reflection of the serene beauty that had been momentarily overshadowed by conflict. We'll be leaving soon, Captain Shambo said, his voice tinged with a hint of nostalgia. Admiral Kasser nodded. Yes, it's time to return to our own world. On board the Chenille, Lloyd Asplund prepared to depart as well. As he reviewed the data collected during their time on this parallel Earth, he couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder about the intricacies of the multiverse. Our journey here has shown us that the universe is vast and full of mysteries, Lloyd said to his team. We've gained knowledge that can shape our understanding of our own world. The time had come for the Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces to bid farewell to this parallel Earth and return to their respective worlds. The ships were prepared, the mobile suits stowed away and the bonds formed in the heat of battle remained strong. As the last rays of sunlight kissed the horizon, the Pan-African Navy's ships and the Zaft vessels began their departure. The waters churned as the ships set sail, and the mobile suits were launched into the sky, their engines roaring to life. Admiral Kasser and Captain Shambo exchanged a final nod, their shared experiences during this unexpected journey forging a connection between their worlds. On the bridge of the Chenille, Lloyd Asplund's eyes sparkled with curiosity and determination. Isla Reconquista and Evian Reconquista gazed out at the sea one last time, grateful for the lessons they had learned. As the Pan-African Navy and Zaft forces vanished from the parallel Earth's horizon, the world returned to its quietude. The remnants of the battle were washed away by the tides, a fading memory of a conflict that had shaped the course of events in their own worlds. The legacy of the Alliance lived on. The lessons learned from their shared struggle continued to inspire cooperation and unity, a beacon of hope against the darkness that threatened peace. And so, as the stars twinkled in the night sky and the waves lapped against the shore, the story of the Pan-African Navy, Zaft, and the parallel Earth concluded, a tale of resilience, collaboration, and the unwavering belief in the power of unity.